So good morning, everyone. My topic for this morning is adult hip dysplasia, which if you consider the time period from adolescence into late adulthood is a very, very broad and long topic. Um, so in order to keep things brief, I've chosen to focus mostly on the post remodeling potential phase. So after the closure of the triradiate cartilage, which I'll speak more about and prior to the degenerative phase of secondary osteoarthritis, as this presents a lot of interesting management considerations and it's not something that we frequently manage here. I'd like to thank Ms. Cole and Mr. Annabelle for their guidance and assistance with this presentation. I'll start off with some background on hip dysplasia, some classification systems, imaging modalities and important radiographic measurements, and finally talk through some management. So the triradiate cartilage and the ossification centers of the ilium, ischium, and pubis form the acetabulum during fetal growth, and this is reliant on molding from the femoral head in order to take on its shape. Early instability of the hip joint uh, leads to abnormal acetabular development and results in a shallow acetabulum. This then results in a spectrum of pathology ranging from subluxed hips to fully dislocated hips. The abnormal positioning of the femoral head then leads to an increased stress on the cartilage matrix and a concentrated force at the acetabular rim, which then progresses to secondary osteoarthritis over time if not addressed. Deformities associated in long term are increased femoral antiversion, coxa valga, head neck junction deformities, femoral head asphericity, hypoplasia of the femoral intermedullary canal, and posterior GT displacement. Early identification of infantile hip dysplasia obviously optimizes long term management and prevention is our best course. Uh, basic management of early infantile hip dysplasia includes things like bracing, using pavlic harnesses, closed and open reductions, and femoral and acetabular osteotomies. In older children, various osteotomies, either volume reducing, redirectional, or salvage osteotomies can be performed to also try and correct deformity. I won't go into too much detail regarding these procedures, as we'll be focusing on the period after the remodeling potential and before the de degenerative change rather than during this time. These patients often present with hip or groin pain of insidious onset and their symptoms and examination findings can give you clues as to whether the hip is undercovered, overcovered, or it's actually a rotationally abnor rotational abnormality. For example, impingement symptoms such as pain with hip flexion when walking up the stairs are more indicative of femoral acetabular impingement in an overcovered hip. These patients are also likely to have a positive FIDIR test. Whereas patients with an undercovered hip may report symptoms of micro or macro instability, for example, when they're walking down the stairs. And these patients are also likely to have a positive hip apprehension test, which is the one down on the bottom left here, um, or pain on the bicycle chest, which is literally just mimicking um, a bicycle motion. Key things to look for on examination of these patients include a Trendelenburg gait suggestive of abductor fatigue. Ligamentous laxity is assessed with the Baten score. Increased internal rotation at the hip with flexion, it's positive anterior apprehension sign, and increased femoral antiversion on prone external rotation, which is the test just at the bottom here. Moving on to classifications in pediatric hip dysplasia, ultrasound can provide both a dynamic assessment of the hip using the Harkey method and also produce the graph classification, which as you can see from this table is quite complex. And as you move into adult hip dysplasia, the two most common classification systems are the Crow and the Hardophilicetus system. The Crow classification details proximal displacement of the femur relative to the vertical height of the pelvis and proximal aggression of the head-neck junction away from the inter-teardrop line. This classification can also be used to guide reconstructive options and component selection in arthroplasty in older patients. The heart of Philokita's classification assesses containment of the femoral head by the acetabulum and is classed as dysplastic type A. Uh, a low dislocation where the femoral head creates a false acetabulum just superior to the true acetabulum, and a high dislocation where the femoral head is actually completely uncovered and is sitting superiorly and posteriorly to the true acetabulum. Both of these classification systems are very broad and based in a dislocation subluxation parameter, and therefore in order to pick up on more subtle differences, radiographic measurements are key in the diagnosis of hip dysplasia. 
in order to make good radiographic measurements, you need to have good x-rays. Um, so in standard series to order is a standing AP, a false profile lateral, and a done 45 degree to assess for cam lesions. Um, the key radiographic signs of hip dysplasia are the lateral center edge angle, um, Sharp's angle, the extrusion index, and the acetabular depth ratio. It's, of course, a bit complex, but they are demonstrated here on the slide. So the lateral center edge angle is this one over here marked LCE. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor on the top left. Um, and this assesses the superlateral coverage on the AP view. Uh, Sharp's angle is over on the very far right here um, and gives an a indication of whether the hip is dysplastic with a measurement of greater than 42 um, and measurements between 39 and 42 are borderline. The extrusion index is measured on the AP is the width of the uncovered femoral head divided by the total width of the femoral head which gives you an idea of the depth and then the acetabular depth ratio is similar with um, depth of the femoral head protruding across the line of the acetabulum. Other important angles are the Charnas angle on the top left, um, which assesses the inclination of the weight-bearing portion of the acetabulum. Um, a normal range is 0 to 10, abnormal is greater than 10 degrees, and impinging is less than 0. Uh, very key in assessing these radiographs is Shenton's line up on the top left, the arc from the medial femoral neck through the superior margin of the obturator foramen. Um, is this detects superior femoral head subluxation and is really important in predicting early osteoarthritis. So the broken line is essentially similar to a low dislocation as per the heart of Foki misclassification. Um, and just on the bottom here is the crossover sign on an AP x-ray. Um, this gives an idea of focal acetabular retroversion. So it's the projection of the anterior wall um, more lateral to the posterior wall at the superior aspect of the acetabulum as it crosses over. So these are the measurements that you routinely look at on plain films and most diagnosis of hip dysplasia is on plain radiographs using these parameters of measurements. CT and MRI can provide further information about morphology and interarticular pathologies and newer um, processes like advanced biomechanics chemical MRI techniques, such as gadolinium-enhanced MRI of cartilage, can actually detect changes in the articular cartilage, such as chondral injury, before it becomes radiographically evident, and it's highly sensitive to arthritic changes. Um, this can actually change management in some of your older patients. Moving on to management, it's largely guided by the morphology and the resultant pathology of the acetabulum and femur, as it presents to you. A uh, dysplastic acetabulum that's too shallow will undercover the hip anteriorly, posteriorly, or globally. This can be corrected with um, a periacetabular osteotomy. Um, it does require an intact Shenton line, so no migration of that femoral head. An acetabulum that's too deep can result in overcoverage and potential for um, femoral acetabular impingement. And if impingement is coming into the presentation, you need to consider whether it's coming from the femoral side, the acetabular side, or both. Um, and these things can be addressed with um, a reverse periacetabular osteotomy to try and reduce the anterior and lateral coverage, um, femoral and acetabular osteoplasty, or labral repairs and takedowns, as there are often concomitant labral tears. However, this is a sticking point of contention because labral tears that occur in this pathology do so because of the underlying mechanical problem. And therefore, going in and doing a repair of the labrum alone and not addressing the underlying mechanical problem doesn't fix it, and therefore the repair is likely to fail. And lastly, rotational abnormalities such as a retroverted acetabulum can be corrected by an antiverting periacetabular osteotomy. Um, and really highlights the need to assess your femoral version preoperatively and consider the need for a femoral rotational osteotomy as part of your procedure. So broadly speaking about periacetabular osteotomy, the goal is to maximize functional life of the hip while reducing pain and restoring normal function by correcting the excessive pressure on the femoral head and on the rim of the acetabulum and the resultant instability in the hip joint. In the commonly used GANS periacetabular osteotomy, a full cut is made at the root of the superior pubic ramus. And inner and outer partial cuts are made at the ischium and ilium without disturbing the posterior column of the acetabulum. 
the acetabular fragment is then mobilized, it's medialized, flexed laterally, sorry, flexed, laterally rotated, and antiverted, though these maneuvers can differ based on the exact pathology and morphology of the acetabulum that you're trying to correct. And it's then fixed with three fully threaded screws, which are usually removed between four and 12 months. Studies have shown good long-term outcomes following periacetabular osteotomies with native hip survivorship up to 86% at 10 years and 60% at 20 years. Though it's worth noting the importance of assessing impingement in these patients as this can adversely affect the survivorship potential if it's not addressed. And to address impingement, you create a spherical femoral head in addition to doing the acetabular reorientation. And doing this actually does improve long-term survivorship post periacetabular osteotomy of that native hip and does decelerate the progression to osteoarthritis in these patients. In patients where significant cartilage degeneration is already present or in older patients, joint preservation is no longer indicated and total hip arthroplasty must be considered. Given the abnormalities of the acetabulum, planning is as for a complex primary total hip. Um, Pre-op radiographic assessment of superior bone stock is essential to ensuring the acetabulum can actually support prosthesis. And while you can use a smaller acetabular component to reduce the need for bone graft, this implicates you to needing to use a smaller diameter head. If you do need to use bone graft, structural autograft from the femoral head or shortening osteotomy can be used. Um, and prosthesis options need to be carefully considered to ensure appropriate options are available. For example, undersized femurs, phantom cups for smaller acetabular dimensions, and cup cage constructs. There's a smidge of um, dysplasia data in the registry. It's worth noting that developmental dysplasia is the fourth most common principal diagnosis in the total hip arthroplasties we perform in Australia. Um, and primary hip total arthroplasty for developmental dysplasia has a higher revision rate in the first month than for primary total hip arthroplasty for osteoarthritis. So things to consider. Um, if you're tossing up whether or not to do peri periacetabular osteotomy or um, arthroplasty, you really need to think about whether or not the patient has evidence of degeneration or not. And it's not so much as thinking about arthroplasty as being an alternative to joint preserving surgery, but more that joint preserving surgery is no longer indicated because there are signs of wear in the joint. They're all, of course, with everything, borderline patients. So borderline hip dysplasia, these patients who have radiographic parameters within dysplastic ranges but are completely asymptomatic. There's various research out there, some that suggests that some of these patients actually get better without treatment over time and that more intervention isn't necessarily better. Um, and also considering rehab, um, periacetabular osteotomy is obviously a very big procedure. Um, it involves a significant rehab time with periods of prolonged touch or restricted weight bearing versus a total hip replacement where the majority of patients are up and mobilizing, weight bearing is tolerated day one. And while younger patients may be able to cope with a prolonged rehab, it could potentially be quite debilitating in older patients and affect their independence or their ability to re return to work or drive. Finally, some take-home messages. Prevention is better than cure, as it applies to most things. Managing dysplastic hips well prior to the triradiate closure gives us better long-term management. Um, beyond this, you're really moving into a joint preservation mode and considering things like periacetabular osteotomy. However, it's a really big undertaking and you need to carefully select your patients and thoroughly screen them for degenerative changes. Arthroplasty in this patients is very complex and requires significant preoperative planning, including specialized imaging to ensure the bony anatomy will support the prosthesis and that appropriate implants are ordered and available. Thank you.